Hey there, and welcome to our online service for this week. My name's Ben, and I'm one of the youth pastors here at PBC. As a church, uh, we're currently working our way through a series looking at who the Holy Spirit is and how He interacts and lives in the life of a believer. So today, Christine's going to come and share with us. Can't wait to hear what Christine's going to share. But before she does, we're just going to press into a time of sung worship. So please join us in that space as we declare the amazing grace that Jesus has poured out, lavished upon us. Shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. You're the healer of 
the sick and the broken. You were comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King, our Savior forever. For eternity, we will sing of all you've done. For eternity, we will sing of all you've done. We sing God with us, God for us. Nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. God with us, God for us. Nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. Thank you, team, for leading us in worship. I want to share with you some really exciting news. In two weeks from today, our 10.45 a.m. service is resuming at Kleins Road, which means that we're going to be gathering every Sunday at 8.45, 10.45, and 5.30. So we want to put the invitation out to you to, to come and join us in person, especially if you're part of our 10.45 service. It's going to be a great opportunity to come reconnect with the 10.45ers um, and worship God as a congregation here on site together. So that's in a fortnight, 1045 service is resuming. Come join us. No need to register. Just scan the QR code on the way in and you'll be, you'll be sweet. Now, as a youth pastor here at PVC, I have the joy and the privilege of leading our young people year five through to year 12. And I'm so excited to share that God is doing some really cool stuff in the lives of our young people. And so we wanted to take some time to share with you what's happening with our youth ministry. So here's a, here's a little update of our youth ministry before Christine comes and shares with us. How much do you know about our youth ministry at PVC? Chances are, if you're not a parent or a young person or a leader, you, you don't know very much, which is totally okay. But 
I want to share with you right now, what do we actually do at PBC Youth? And also, how do we need your help? So my name's Ben, by the way, and I'm one of the youth pastors at PBC. And alongside Ben Sterling, we get to oversee 17 absolutely legendary youth leaders across our programs. And every week, what do we do? We run four programs, uh, and two of them happen on a Friday night. So let's start there. The two on Friday night, our heart is simple for these nights. We want to create a welcoming and inclusive space that young people from year 5 to 12, no matter who they are, when they come here, they will hear of and experience the radical grace of Jesus. Right, And our heart really is to to share Jesus. And as we look at the gospel, we see that that happens most effectively within the context of relationships. So we get up to some fun stuff to build community. Uh, We get to do the classic three-legged races and newspaper hockey and water nights, giant ice cream nights, uh, getaways and camps. Um, Or my favorite, water spitting competitions. You know, you can get it the furthest. We, We get up to loads of fun stuff. Not for the sake of it, but to create a context where we get to share Jesus. We run two more programs outside of Friday, uh, which are just designed to, where our heart is to nurture the faith of our young people, to see them become disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And you get the picture, hey? That's what we do. How do we need your help though? This is important. I actually want to share with you a praise point, which actually has a challenge in it. About five years ago, we had a weekly attendance of 15, 20 young people-ish, um, which is no longer the case. Uh, we aren't getting an average of 20 young people a night. Right now, we're actually getting an average of 127 young people every Friday night, which is absurd, <laughs> which is awesome. Ben and I were in the offices on Monday, and we were just celebrating how across nine weeks of youth ministry this year, we've seen 201 young people join us, 201, which is awesome, right? It's exciting, right? We we don't celebrate the numbers. We celebrate the potential the numbers hold. Of those 200 people, a bunch of them don't know Jesus. Here is an opportunity for people to meet Jesus. And then picture like even even 140 young people who we had on Friday night. If all of them were disciples who, who, who wanted to make Jesus known in their life, then go into their life context and share Jesus with one person or, or two people, then the, the impact of our youth ministry goes from just 140 people to 200, 300, 400 people like that. <laughs> like this is exciting. The image that Jesus uses, like that I that I really resonate with, is that this harvest is plentiful. There is potential for the kingdom right here in front of us. But when Jesus uses that image, he also he also has a challenge. He when he says it to his disciples, he says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And therein lies our challenge. On Friday night we had 140 kids. We had 15 leaders which is essentially like a soccer team per leaders, leader. It's, it's, it's a lot of young people for the amount of leaders that we have. And, there, and our need right now is what Jesus was talking about there with his disciples. We need people to step into this place of serving in our youth ministry, serving our young people. So if right now you're hearing this and you're feeling inspired and you want to be a part of what God is doing in the life of our young people, if you don't fit into a certain age bracket or you don't have certain skills, don't worry about that. You know, we'll, get, we'll get that sorted. Um, God doesn't, he doesn't just call those who are prepared. He prepares those who he calls. If you're feeling inspired and you want to step into this ministry, then would you hit me up? Ben at parentbaptist.com. Not my name, my email. Shoot me an email as soon as you possibly can. Let's have this conversation. Give us a call. Visit the office. Talk to a pastoral team member. And let's see what your involvement is in what God is doing amongst our young people could look like. We're excited. We are so excited to harness the potential and see God work through us in powerful ways with our young people. Will you join us? I also wanted to share with you another chance to, um, that we'd love your support in. Um, on Friday, again, 140 kids, and we, we, in our small groups, we read the Bibles together. But we only have 25 physical Bibles Uh, which is a challenge in itself. So we actually want to invite you to buy a Bible for our young people, right? To buy some Bibles for our young people. We want to get this from 25 up to, um, you know, 100 or so, right? And in our description of this video, nice and simple, if you head there, you'll find a link to buy a Bible for our young people. Only 20 bucks for a Bible, um, but obviously goes well outside of our budget. So we would really appreciate you supporting us financially as well.
Now, when Jesus shares about the harvest to his disciples, as the harvest is, is plentiful, but the workers are few, his next phrase is quite important, and that is his instruction. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers out into the field. So, if you're keen, if you want to be the answer to our prayers, if you want to be a part of our youth ministry, then come and have a conversation. If you want to support us financially, then we'll be so grateful. Head to the link and you, and you can do that there. And we also ask that you would be doing exactly what Jesus instructed, asking God to bring the people in who we need. So Lord, we, we do exactly that. We just ask that you would be drawing people into our youth leadership teams, those who have a heart to see lives transformed and people impacted for your glory. And God, we pray um, for the impact that those people are going to make in the lives of our young people. And we don't do it for our own glory. We don't do it for our own show. But Lord, in everything that we do, in everything that happens in the life of our youth ministry, in the life of our young people, we give you the praise. To you be the glory forever. Isn't it so exciting and so encouraging what God is doing amongst our young people? Well, before Christine comes to speak, we're going to read from God's Word. So if you have your Bibles, do open them up and open them up to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to begin in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free, free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit, who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again, Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of God. Hello, I am Christine. I usually attend the 5.30 service and I'm in my last year studying at Bible College. In the last few weeks following on from Easter, we have been looking at what the cross, uh, the death and the resurrection of Jesus means for us as disciples living on this side of the cross, uh, beyond the cross. And last week, uh, Kathy introduced us to the Holy Spirit and the importance of his role as we be and make disciples. And so this week, following on from Kathy's message, uh, we will be looking at the new life that we have through the Spirit and because of the events of the cross. 
this is a picture of my sisters and I. That's me in the middle. When we, uh, you and I, uh, were babies, our parents, or maybe our siblings, <laughs> coaxed us to walk. Uh, we had the ability to walk. We had legs that were designed to walk. And our parents beckoned us to come and enjoy the, the wonders of walking, freedom of where our two little legs could take us. A world that was awaiting us. Have you ever found uh, that when you read the Bible, like when we read today's passage or uh, when you read the stories of the Gospels or the events of the early church, have you ever found uh, that it's like you're looking into another world, and another life, something divine, something wonderful and beyond the ordinary? And have you ever found that as you read it, it is, it is like it is beckoning you in. You know, just like the coaxing parents come. You have legs. You have the spirit. Come, enjoy the wonders of this world and the freedom of it. If you just walk. Paul, the writer of our reading today, gave us three incredible realities of our new life. Realities that I don't think we'll ever fully grasp the wonders of and that were impossible for us to have, but God generously made possible. But like the crawling baby, we need to choose to walk, to choose to enter into them. And I wonder how many of us Christians are choosing to walk in these realities. Have we come to believe that the Christian walk is about getting into heaven and not getting heaven into us? But the Bible says, I taste and see that the Lord is good. It does not say wait and see. It does not say obey and see or observe from a distance and see. It says taste, taste, experience, enjoy the wonders of God's goodness that is available now. So let's have a look at these three reali realities that Paul gives us and let us see how we can choose to step more into the fullness of the wonderful heavenly new life that God has given us. So the first reality uh, that Paul says is that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, I have no skill when it comes to bowling in a bowling alley. I, I throw the ball and I think I'm aiming straight for the 10 pins and I, and I don't understand, but the ball decides that I didn't throw it straight and it goes into the gutter instead. But isn't this us in life? It's like this, it's like I do not understand what I do for what I, I want to do, I do not do, and what I hate, I do. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. These are Paul's words in Romans 7. But isn't this us in life? Even though I throw the ball straight, it never goes straight, and the situation seems damned, helpless. is the state of condemnation that humanity finds themselves in. Paul calls it captivity to the law of sin and death. But, Paul says, but for those in Christ Jesus, there is now no condemnation. Because through Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life, has set us free.
from the law of sin and death. We are set free. And because of that, there is no longer condemnation. This is an incredible reality of our new life. But as I said before, we need to choose to enter into it. So what does choosing to enter into it look like? Well, first we need to realize our need, that we do need help, uh, that without Jesus we will keep on taking that path that leads to death. We may try and rationalize and excuse ourselves and just say, well, I just blew it. And maybe we did just blow it. And maybe in another circumstance we might not have blown it, but either way we are the kind of person who blows it. This does not pardon us. So we need to recognize our need for Jesus' rescue. And then we need to do something which is very humbling. We need to admit to our sin. Admit that our sin was our fault and our doing. We do not helplessly sin. We willingly sin. We choose to reject God and go our own way and do the thing that is harmful to us. We need to admit to this by asking God for forgiveness for it. And then we need to accept God's forgiveness and grace. Paul says there is now, now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Now this is settled, final, established. We need to accept this truth and trust the finality of it. And as Jesus forgives us, so we also ought to forgive ourselves. I mean, is our judgment more superior than Jesus's? If Jesus has forgiven us, then we are forgiven. So realizing our need, admitting to our wrongdoing and accepting God's forgiveness, this is what yes, choosing yes to God looks like and his offer of no condemnation. But as uh, with a man uh, asking a woman to marry him and, and she says yes to him, after that she must devote her life to being married to the man and step into all that it means to be married to him. And the same is with the no condemnation God gives us. We need to choose yes by doing these things, but following that we also need to live a life that uh, matches our decision. And so I invite you to ask yourself, does your life match your decision? So this is the first incredible reality that there is no condemnation for us. And the second incredible reality that Paul tells us we have and must choose to enter. And, And what Kathy looked at last week is that we have the Spirit of God living in us. Paul says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. When I was 16, my older sister found a tattered old book in my father's uh, bookshelf. And this book was about the Holy Spirit. And so um, up to this time, I personally had never given much thought to the Holy Spirit. I just thought he was some mystical spiritual force that didn't matter much to my life and faith. Uh, But my sister, um, she read this book and reading the book, uh, decided to invite the Holy Spirit into her life in a way that she'd never done before. And as she did, she had an incredible encounter with the Holy Spirit. And she told me about this. And so I was curious, and so I uh, decided uh, after she'd finished reading the book to read it myself. And the book was simply a story of a man's story and own experience of the Holy Spirit, nothing special. Uh, But one thing he invited his readers to do uh, was to welcome the Holy Spirit into their own lives. He said that uh, the Holy Spirit... We, that we often ignore the Holy Spirit and we grieve him because he is a relational being. And so one day, uh, sitting on my bed, I, uh, I said to the Holy Spirit, 
and said, I welcome you, Holy Spirit. And that day changed my life. That day, I experienced love and peace that I cannot explain. An experience that I now know as his presence. That day, God became personal and intimate to me. I had had the Holy Spirit living in me when I had accepted Christ, but I had been ignoring him. I had not invited him into my life. But that day when I welcomed him, his presence changed everything. You see, the Spirit is God. And God comes to us in the most intimate way. As the Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You are in the realm of the Spirit, Paul says. This is an incredible reality of the new life God has given us. But again, we, we must choose to enter this wonderful reality. We must welcome the Holy Spirit. Not just once, but day after day after day into all of our life. But more than just a welcome, Spirit is not just a guest that we invite when we so desire. He wants to own our house and run it and be in charge of it. He doesn't want to be welcomed as a visitor, but he wants to be welcomed in charge. In a life away from God, the order of dominance in a person's being is this. Here, the body rules the mind. The mind rules the spirit our human spirit, that is, and the spirit rules God. Everything runs under the control of the body. Paul puts it this way, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. In contrast, a life under God, the order of dominance in a person's being is this. Here the body serves the mind, the mind serves the spirit, and the spirit serves God. Paul describes it this way, for, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Paul only gives two options. We either live according to the flesh or according to the Spirit, and our order of dominance in our being will reflect this. When a person accepts Jesus, their order of dominance is not instantly corrected, but God brings us on a love journey where we learn to trust God and, and to surrender each aspect of our being to him. But as love requires choice, so we are required to choose to surrender each aspect to him. So let's have a look at what uh, surrendering our being, um, look at each of these aspects and what surrendering each of them looks like. So we'll start at the top with the body. Now, the body is God's good creation. It's God's temple where he dwells by his spirit. And it needs to be properly cared for, but not as master, but as servant of God. And because the body is the primary source uh, for gratification and the instrument for what we get what we want, it is the most vulnerable to the fleshly nature, uh, the fleshly nature being an enmity to God. And because of this, the body cannot be in charge. So how do we surrender our body so that it's in the right place in our order of dominance? We do this through disciplining our bodies to submit to the way of the spirit. As master, our body will forever be screaming for attention. I want food. I want a drink. I want sex. I want to obey my orders. Attend to me. We need to teach our body to hear the word, no, I won't submit to you. We need to discipline it. At first it will probably feel like an agonizing and strenuous exercise repeated from time to time against great internal uh, resistance. Uh, but eventually, as one living in the spirit, it will become an overall settled condition where our bodies live in harmony with God's spirit. And so I encourage you, 
Find an area in your own life where your body has been screaming for attention and practice saying no to it. This could look like doing fitness and pushing your body beyond what it wants to do. It could look like fasting for a whole day or it could look like denying yourself entertainment or waking up earlier. Pray, ask God, what's an area uh, that you have been submitting to your body once and surrender your body in this way to God, under God. The next is the mind. And as we know, uh, people can go too far in denying their bodies to the point uh, that they're not properly caring for their bodies anymore. So the mind cannot be in control either. Uh, the mind easily lends itself to rationalize the things of the fleshy nature. Paul ha has great concern about the mind. He mentions the mind five times in our passage today, as saying that the eternal consequence of a mind governed by the fleshly nature is death. But the eternal consequence of a mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. This is incredibly important. And so how do we surrender our minds so that it is governed by God's spirit? We do this uh, by taking control of our minds so that it doesn't go astray. Uh, the Bible tells us uh, to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Dr. Caroline Leaf, who specializes in the area of cognitive neuroscience, says that it is proven scientifically that our thoughts, imagination, choices uh, change the physical structure of our brains. What this means is our thoughts, imagination and choices, through them we can choose um, to control and change our thought patterns so that they are healthy. Our brain does not control us, we control our brains, Caroline says. The Bible tells us how we can do this. It says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, anything that is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. By controlling what we think on, we free our minds from the fleshly nature, and we bring it under the governance of the spirit. And the last aspect of our being is our spirit, our human spirit. Many of us find ourselves uh, believing and acting as if the new life is in the after only in the afterlife, and not living in it now. And this is because uh, we believe we still believe ourselves to be in charge of our lives. Each man to his own life, we say. So we've convinced ourselves that self-obedience is the only reasonable path to take. I want this, I get this. But John Calvin, a great reformer, once said, the surest source of destruction to a man is to obey themselves. So how do we uh, surrender ourselves fully under God? We need to die to self. Jesus puts it this way, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is very severe, <laughs> what Jesus is asking. Uh, the cross was an instrument of death and, and those hearing Jesus would have been imagining the people standing, uh, hanging outside their village walls at that moment. This is a ruthless killing of us being in charge that Jesus is asking of us. We need to lose, completely kill, lose our lives in order to find our new life. We need to die to self. Before we despair over such a harsh command, we need to see the beauty in it. What does dying to self look like? It looks like trusting God. Trusting God over what our body wants. Trusting God over our mind. Trusting and having confidence in him over us being in charge. And the more we experience the care, the more we can let go and are freed from the burden of caring for ourselves. 
Just like a child trusts their parents, so we can trust God. And so I encourage you, in your own life, identify areas where you have taken charge. It could be your finances, your family, your work, your health, your study, your time, your relationships. And start making a deliberate effort to ask God, how should I use this money you've blessed me with? How do you want me to spend this day? Lead me in this conversation with this friend. Be led by the Spirit. Move when he moves. Welcome the Holy Spirit, not as a visitor, but in charge. So they are two incredible realities of our new life. There is no condemnation for us. And we have the Spirit of God living in us. The third incredible reality that Paul tells us we have and must choose to enter the fullness of is that we have been adopted into God's family. I was told a story uh, of a lady who um, was adopted at birth and when her adoptive parents died, uh, she decided to have a look for her her birth mother. And she discovered that her birth mother was still alive and arranged a meeting with her, and and she had a wonderful meeting. Um, She discovered um, that when she was born, her parents were not married, and so they gave her up for adoption. But after that, they did get married, and so she had actually several full siblings. She had always felt incomplete, like a part of her was missing. But now she found not only her mother, but her family. She belonged and was accepted. When we were without God, we were like that lady. We were incomplete and alone. But the incredible reality of our new life is that we now have a family. We belong and are accepted. For all eternity, God has been fellowshipping in relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in perfect divine love. And now Paul says, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to son and daughtership. What this means is this beautiful relationship that has been happening for eternity has now become ours. And Paul says, by him, we cry, Abba, Father, Only one person ever used this personal address of God, and that was Jesus. The intimate relationship that Jesus had is now ours. The word know, to to know someone or to know God, in Hebrew, yada, uh, has the kind of sense of of the the kind of um, intimacy between a husband and wife. And so it's this kind of depth of knowledge and closeness to God that God is inviting us to know him and him know us. Paul considers everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus his Lord. And if, What did Paul know and experience? And if we still feel like we're losing something, uh, then... What haven't we grasped yet that he had? Again, we need to choose to enter this reality. God designed us for love and love requires free will. God has offered us intimacy, but he does not push. He waits for us to come to him, to choose him. One time, a lady who prays for me I uh, woke up in the middle of the night and, and she felt the Holy Spirit come on upon her quite powerfully and uh, she felt God was saying to her about me uh, that God wanted me to spend an hour with him every day. And this message she kept telling me for <laughs> about over a year. Um, she felt unsure of herself and felt bad telling me this, uh, but she really felt that God, sensed that God was calling me to spend an hour with him every day. 
I <laughs> knew this was from God because God had been telling me the same thing. He kept saying over and over through all different things, he kept saying to me, Christine, seek my face, seek my face, spend time with me. It seems he has to repeat a message like five or ten times before I get it. <laughs> and that whole year I felt dry and distant from God and I wondered why God was so distant to me. But eventually I gave in and I set my alarm clock an hour earlier and I devoted that time to just being with God. Nothing else could have that time. And at first it, it didn't feel anything special. I just diligently read the Bible and prayed. But slowly this rhythm started to refresh my soul and the words of the Bible became like food to me. And God's presence so tangible and precious. Now I feel a terrible lack if I miss a day of it. And this hour is starting to <laughs> feel a bit too short. But that same message uh, that God gave me, uh, spend an hour with me or seek my faith. I, I want to pass on that message to you and just invite you to hear God's voice asking you to spend time with him. The new life we have been given means three incredible realities for us. There is no condemnation for us. We have the spirit of God living in us and we have been adopted into God's family. Let us not live as though the Christian walk is about getting into heaven and not already having heaven in us. Let us live in the fullness of life that God has offered us now to enjoy. The beauty of love and intimacy with him, the fellowship with his spirit and no stain of condemnation. He has given us a taste of heaven that is to come and the more we enter into this, the more we will experience the wonder of what is to come. Let us stop crawling on the ground, on the dusty floor like a baby and let us start to walk and start running and jumping and skipping into the new life that God has given and established for us now. Let's pray. Thank you, God. Because we were stuck in a state of condemnation and we were being led astray by the fleshly nature towards death and we were alone without a family. But God, you came. And Jesus, you died on a cross. And by this, we have been set free. You gave us your spirit to be with us and to have fellowship with us all the days of our life. Thank you for this beautiful gift. And help us, God, to choose you and to enter into these wonderful realities that you've given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are the light, song of my life. You always lead.
song of my life. You always lead me. You are the voice inside. You are my love. No one before you. All that I am, it points to you. Thank you, Christine, for sharing with us. Uh, I really appreciate how you use your passion um, and your gifts of teaching to encourage and build up this community here. Now, as, as Christine was sharing and as we work through this series, if there are questions around who the Holy Spirit is and how He operates and lives in, in the life of a believer, um, then we want to invite you to come and to join us at a short course called Life in the Spirit. It's going to be kicking off in term three, so you can put it in your pencil it into your diary. Um, but it's, it's a short course where for a number of weeks, we just dive in deep and ask, what does it mean to live in step with the Holy Spirit every day of our lives? So that's coming up. But if you have questions right now about who the Holy Spirit is, then we, we also want to invite you to come and to talk to us as a pastoral team. Shoot us an email, give us a call, come visit us in the office. Um, if you have questions about the Spirit or if you want to receive prayer, um, open invite, come and, and contact us. Thank you for joining us online this week. Have a wonderful week.